share with us from the Bible your answer. I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles. Do you have your Bibles this evening? Let's go to John chapter 14 and John chapter 15. It's a good question. People are talking about how they want Jesus to come and live inside them and to have Jesus touching their lives. The question is, is there a difference and is there something climactic coming in the future? And I believe the Bible teaches that there is. Let's go and look at what the Bible has to say. John chapter 14, verse 25 and verse 26. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the who? Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you how many things? All things, and bring to your remembrance all the things I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The promise of Jesus is that as he ascended to heaven, he promised to send the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us and to be his representative in our hearts. Now, Pastor Jericho, there's one other verse we got to go to, and that's in Acts chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to the fifth book of the New Testament, Acts chapter 1. And you'll notice this is right at the ascension of Christ. He's died, he's been resurrected, he's met with the disciples, and he's about to go to heaven. And I want you to notice what the Bible says here in Acts chapter 1. We're going to be reading in verse 9. You've got to picture the scene. The disciples are there, gathered around Jesus. Jesus has just spoken his blessings. Now notice these words. Now when he spoke these things, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, while they watched, he was taken up, and clouds received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in what? Like manner. Uh, so, I mean, like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So... Here's what the angels left the disciples with an amazing promise, and that promise is true today. Just as Christ was taken up from the disciples, and as he promised, he sends the Holy Spirit, so Christ will return in the clouds of glory. 1 Thessalonians 4 paints the picture as well to take his people home. So, in answer to the question, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, yes, Jesus dwells in our heart, but... There is a day coming that's climactic when Jesus will come back, visible, auditory, and we're going to have a night on that, looking at that in detail, and we'll take his people home. Thank you. Beautiful answer. Amazing. Question number two. Haven't there always been wars and rumors of wars? What is different now? Now, I believe this is referencing a prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24. Can you explain that to us, Pastor Mills? It's a good question. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. This will be a quick answer, but I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Right there, the first book of the New Testament. And I want you to notice verse 8. We spoke about this quite a bit last night, but I'm just going to focus in on this one point and uh, explain it from here. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. And when you're there, would you say amen? Notice what it says. Christ here, as you'll remember from last night, has just gone through the signs of the second coming. And then he says this in verse 8. All these things are the what? Beginning of sorrows. Now the word sorrows here in the Greek is equated with the word labor. All these are the beginning of labors. And I mentioned this last night, but just to answer the question, I'll reiterate it again here. As the labor contractions get closer and closer together, what do you know is about to come if you're a mother? The baby's about to arrive. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see here. Yes, there have been wars going back thousands of years. Yes, there have been natural disasters. But as we get closer to the end, as we saw the stats last night, they are increasing in intensity and they are getting worse. And all of that is an evidence that, they're, that the second coming of Christ is getting closer and closer, and soon we're going to go home. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Mills. We will be having question and answer every night. 
and I want to encourage you to come and hear those answers. If you have a question, thank you, Pastor Jericho. If you have a question, there will be a question box after the meeting tonight in the back. I would like to encourage you to fill out your um, question, put it on the sheet of paper, and put it in the box, and we will attempt from the Bible to answer your questions tomorrow evening. I'm going to invite my wife, Lindsay Mills, to come up here and share with us our health talk for this evening. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be back with you tonight and to learn more together about how we can take better care of our bodies and of our health. Now, we talk a lot about health care benefits. In fact, that's a hot topic in our country. But what about self-care benefits? Did you know there are doctors that actually still make house calls? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And no matter how you write the prescription, health care is expensive. But God has provided these doctors in your home that can help you on a day-to-day basis. So we're going to talk about some of these self-care benefits this evening. And we're actually doing an overview of the life-changing principles that are part of the Balanced Living series that can add quality and value and better health to our lives. So the following eight doctors are experts. Isn't that good? I always want to make sure that I'm going to someone who knows what they're doing. Um, Specialists are great because they know each of the intricacies of their field. Um, But these doctors we're going to talk about are experts in improving physical, mental, and spiritual health. And you can use them every day, and they'll reduce the risk of disease for many of you, for many of us. They'll reduce the risk or the need for drugs and doctor's fees. Isn't that good news? And that is powerful self-care benefit package. The first one is nutrition. When it comes to nutrition, the major battle is not for the bulge, it's actually for the brain. My dad was sitting on an airplane next to a man that worked for one of these major food corporations. Did you know processed food is actually made to be addictive and to get your brain to want more? It's not all about the weight, it's about the brain. And we have to realize that. Nutrition choices, the choices we make, have a powerful effect on our mood, our memory, our learning, and our behavior. And so when we're choosing our foods, they call the, um, the produce department, that's the department of defense. So that's where you want to start. And select a rich rainbow of colors because those are high in antioxidants. Um, the fiber in these foods will help to satisfy the appetite so we don't crave food as much. And it has nutrients that actually help lower stress and improve mental function and mood. So adding more fruits and vegetables, especially fresh ones, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds to our meals um, can help for brain-boosting power. Also, part of nutrition is enjoying more water. And it's a real energy booster. Sometimes we end up eating, we think we're hungry, when really we're just thirsty. And our bodies misinterpret the signals that are being sent to say that we're hungry when if we could just grab a cup of water, satisfy our thirst, uh, then we would know if we were really hungry or thirsty in about 15 minutes. Um, But choosing water instead of other high calorie and high sugar drinks is always the best option. Water is the um, the best liquid. Fresh air and exercise. And exercising, especially when it's in the fresh air, is the best. improve our our head as well as our heart health it can improve mood and lower stress and it also helps with learning and remembering one thing you'll want to remember about exercise is that motion balances emotion motion balances emotion just ask my husband he always encourages me to get my exercise it helps it makes a difference for me Rest. Most Americans actually don't get enough sleep at night, at least not enough satisfying sleep. 
Uh, this might be one of the actual most neglected natural doctors. We always talk about nutrition and exercise, right? But how often do we talk about rest? And it, it really does heal. It's when our bodies and our minds heals from the stresses of the day. Rested people deal with stress better. They have healthier weight, better brain function, and even better self-control. The tired brain, I'm sure many of you can understand this, the tired brain doesn't discern as much, it doesn't care as much, and it doesn't resist as much. And this is why we go home after a long day of having to do all, take care of all of our responsibilities, and we don't care that we pull out that pint of ice cream in the freezer, because we are just tired. And you know what? We deserve it. Isn't that how it goes? It's like, you know what? I've worked really hard today. I really deserve to treat myself. But is it really treating ourselves? No. So getting that rest and those regular sleep, it helps control the stress hormones that sap our mental energy and, it, and inhibits learning and impaired judgment. It's easier to make good choices with a rested body and brain. And one of the things that can help this is creating a sleep routine. Um, research is really showing, actually, that having some sort of routine, calming routine before going to bed, helps to get better sleep. And this is especially important if you deal with insomnia. Um, one of the things that's really good to do is cutting out screen time an hour before you go to bed because screen time can actually wake up the brain, which makes it harder to sleep. So sleep routines could be simple, like a, reading a short section of a book, story time with kids, an evening walk with the dog, just anything that's relaxing and sets the stage for better sleep. Positive thinking, our attitude. Now, attitude is our outlook or orientation toward people, situations, and life. And a lot of times when we have a bad attitude, what's happening is we're focusing on the problems instead of the solutions. And so changing our attitude has to do with adjusting our focus and, and focusing more on solutions and on the positive side of things than on the problems. Problems are as big as we let them be in our brain. But that attitude adjustment is possible. And we learned that last night. Relationships. So it's important to take time for healthful relationships. And relationships can be the biggest stressor in our lives. Um, oftentimes, we can be poor, we can barely have any food, but as long as we're happy with the people we're with, life is okay. But we can live in a mansion with the best of everything we can afford, and if our relationships are broken, it's not okay. So taking time for others and sharing in their lives puts our own problems in perspective and also creates an outlet for loving, um, loving others, for kindness, and for caring. And that's really the true source of joy and fulfillment, when we feel like we've been able to be a part of other people's lives and have a meaningful part in that. Mental fitness, challenging our brain by learning new and positive things, changes our world for the better. Um, if there's something new you want to learn, it's never too late. In fact, research is showing that learning new things and intentionally taking up things that cause you to learn and adjust in your thinking helps to delay dementia, the onset of dementia, and Alzheimer's. So taking a French class, um, going and learning something new, it's worth it. It will help in the long run with your health. Positive choices. Our daily positive choices help overcome big, bad habits. And practicing those positive choices every day helps to create positive habits and replace the negative ones. Now it's always important, and I mentioned this last night, but it is always important when you make lifestyle changes to work with your healthcare provider, especially if you're experiencing serious or chronic conditions. And this is because lifestyle changes work really well. And if you're on blood pressure medication and you made lifestyle changes and didn't talk to your doctor, the lifestyle changes in combination with your medication could actually cause the opposite of high blood pressure, and you might be dealing with low blood pressure and be passing out and end up in the doctor's office 
because all of a sudden you have two powerful forces working together to lower your bl blood pressure. The same goes for many things, but it's important when you make lifestyle changes to work um, under the supervision of, of a doctor because it, lifestyle changes can reduce or eliminate the need for certain medications over time. And the last one we're going to talk about tonight is spiritual health. This is at the center of a healthy lifestyle. And what it really comes down to is making peace with God and allowing his plan and purpose and power to guide our life. I love that God is holistic in his care for us. He doesn't just say, I want you to have a relationship with me. He says, I want you to live an abundant life. Third John chapter 2, or verse 2, there's only one chapter, says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So God's eight natural doctors are just an expression of his love for us. And they're part of his plan to bring restoration and renewal into our lives. Would you like to ask God just now to help us to make those changes so that we can experience that restoration and renewal? Amen. Me too. God wants to do that for us. So that's our little nugget for tonight, and I'll hand it back over to Phil. Grateful for the health that God provides for us. As we move into our meeting for this evening, we are blessed with a quartet of gentlemen that are going to be singing a song that I know you will really appreciate. And then the next voice you will hear will be that of Pastor Jericho. Gentlemen. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. There's a long white robe in the heaven, I know. There's a long white robe. There's a long white robe in the heaven I know, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know. And I don't want to leave me behind. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. And I don't want to leave me behind. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know. And I don't want to leave me behind. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. And I don't want to leave me behind. There's a golden harp in the heaven I know. There's a golden harp in the heaven I know. There's a golden harp in the heaven I know. And I don't want to leave me behind. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Chariots are coming. And I don't want to leave me behind. are coming. Sweet news. Sweet news. Chariots are coming. Good news. Good news. Good news. Good news. And I don't want to leave. And I don't want to leave me.
Good evening. My friends, how are you tonight? Are you excited? I am excited. Last night we did a little something, and I want to encourage you guys to do it again with me tonight. If you will, take your Bible in your hands, raise them up, and together we are going to say what? If it's in the Word of God, we want it. Say it with me. If it's in the Word of God, we want it. If it's not in the Word of God, we don't want it. Let's say it again together. If it's in the Word of God, we want it. But if it's not in the Word of God, we don't want it. Tonight, my friends, I don't want you to hear from me a message being presented to you. Tonight, I want you to dive with me into the Bible, into the Word of God, and we are going to discover some precious promises, some beautiful truths that God wants to share with every single one of us tonight. Before we dive into our lecture for tonight, I'm going to, invite, I'm going to kneel and I want to invite you to join me in prayer. You can bow your heads and close your eyes. We are going to go before our Creator. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight for the privilege to be gathered together with my friends here tonight, opening your word, studying your truth, and discovering your character in a more beautiful and amazing way. Father, tonight I ask that you touch my lips with a coal from your altar. May I be hid behind your son, and may he be the one presenting tonight and not me. I ask all these things in the precious and beautiful name of your Son who came and gave his life for me and for each of us. We thank you for hearing our in and answering our prayers, Father. Amen. So last night we looked, Pastor Mills shared with us, we looked at Bible prophecy and he went and he gave a quick overview of what Bible prophecy is. And he left us with a promise. Can anyone tell me what that promise is? Jesus is coming soon. Again, Jesus is coming soon. Tonight, we are going to see exactly how soon His coming is. I want to share a story with you. On October 12, 1912, many of you will recognize this picture. The Titanic left for its maiden voyage from Hampton, England, bound for New York. It was in the winter time, icebergs were floating, and they received a message. Slow down, you're going too fast, there are icebergs in your path. Captain Smith made a fatal decision. On board were more than 2,200 souls, the elite of the elite, the wealthiest of the wealthy the crim of the crop. And the captain made a decision that put the lives of those people, as we know, in peril. He chose to heed the warning? No. Friends, he chose to disregard the warning. Tonight, I want to encourage you guys not to disregard the warning that we are going to be looking at. I want to encourage you guys to hear and to heed the warning. And we're going to be looking at what that warning is. Traveling at 26 miles an hour, the Titanic was cruising the Atlantic. Everything seemed to be going. Bands, 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 smoke of cigars was twirling around, and everything seemed to be at peace. Over the intercom, one of the watchmen cried, there's an iceberg in the path. Turn the ship. But my friends, it was too late. They attempted all they could to try to turn the ship, but they could not. And in turn, the ship sliced along the side of the iceberg and put a 300-foot gash in the side of the boat that was deemed unsinkable. In fact, one person said that God himself could not even sink this ship. Now, can I ask you, 
Do we have the power to tell God what to do? Absolutely not. God holds the power of everything in his hand. Water began to fill the ship, and she began to sink, and the captain ordered the lifeboats off. But because the ship was, seen, was deemed unsinkable, they didn't have enough lifeboats. And as the people began to pour over, only 700 people were able to make it off the boat and to safety. Tonight, we're going to look at the lifeboat and see how to capture and how to get on board the lifeboat. Many people lost their lives. Today, as we look into the Bible, into the Word of God, we will see that like the Titanic, our world is heading for destruction. We are going to see that our world is wrapped in turmoil, and we are going to see how God outlines His rescue mission. Not long ago, politicians, scientists, and many others unveiled the doomsday clock, which in their minds predicted the time based upon events that are happening in our world today, the time that the close of Earth's history would come. But friends, we know that they were wrong. Dr. Stephen Hawking, a scientist, made this statement, it is important for the human race to spread out into space for the survival of the species. Life on Earth is at risk, it is at ever increasing risk of being wiped out by a natural disaster, nuclear war, a genetically engineered virus, or other dangers we have not yet heard of. He goes on to say, we will not find anything as nice as, as go to another star system. Little did he know how true his words were. Brothers and sisters, we will not find anything as nice on this earth. But we are bound for another star system. And what is that star system, friends? It is heaven. And I want to go to heaven. How about you? I, I think we all will agree with that. Many scientists want to claim that their method is correct. They want to say that, oh, this is going to happen and then this is what is going to happen. And others will say, no, he's wrong. This is what is going to happen. But beloved brothers and sisters, because that's what you are. God created us all, and you are my brothers and sisters. Tonight, we are going to look at what the Bible buys us through prophecy as it gives us insights to where this world is headed. Are you ready to go on this amazing journey with me? Well, let's begin. Turn with me in your Bibles, or you can read on the screen. This Bible verse, remember the former things of old. God is here and He is promising to us. He says, remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God. Again, He says, and there is none like me. But what promise does He give us? He says, here is how you are to know I am God. He says, declaring the end from the beginning. What do we call that? Friends, what do we call that? De when we declare the end from the beginning, come again. Prophecy, very good. Declaring the end from the beginning, we call that prophecy. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. We are going to look at a prophecy that came in ancient time that is still relevant for you and for me today. My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Again, we are told, Behold, the formal things have come to pass, and new things I will declare before they spring forth. I will tell you of them. Jesus is promising that He will tell us what is going to happen before it happens. One last verse. And now I have told you before it comes that when it comes to pass, you may what? You may believe. The reason God wants us to understand prophecy, the reason God gives us prophecy is for what reason? The reason God gives us prophecy is so that we can what? We can believe. And brothers and sisters, I want to believe. Fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of what? Of God's Word. And gives us the what? Confidence the future is what? Is in His hands. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is where? 
in God's hands. Who is Bible prophecy about, and what does it say about those who read it? Read it with me, brothers and sisters. Revelation, and it's connecting. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The book of Revelation tells us what? It is a revealing. Some people do not understand the book of Revelation, and they say that it is a closed book. It is too hard to understand. But brothers and sisters, Revelation in itself, the term means a revealing, an opening, an unveiling. And Jesus himself says, it is what? Read it with me. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must, what? Shortly take place. God has given us the book of Revelation as a book that reveals to us what? The future. What is going to shortly take place? He sent and signified it, signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Going on to verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Going on in verse 3, he says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Brothers and sisters, where is the only place in the Bible you can find a triple blessing? It is in the book of Revelation in the third verse of the chapter 1. It says, Blessed is he that what? reads. Not only are we to read, but we are to hear the words of this prophecy. But brothers and sisters, reading and hearing is not enough. We are challenged to go a step further than hearing and reading, and we are challenged to what? Keep those things which are written in where? In the Bible, in God's Word, in God's love letter for you and me. We are challenged to keep those things. Why? For the time is near, for the time is near. Moving on, later on in the chapter, verse 17, and I, John, saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as one dead. But he laid at his hand, he laid his hand right on, his right hand on me, and said to me, do not be afraid, I am. Now who is talking here? Jesus, and he says, I am what? The first and the last. Jesus here is saying, I am hold the future. I was here from the beginning and I hold the future. Brothers and sisters, what are we not instructed to do regarding Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation? We don't have to speculate. The Bible gives us the answer in Revelation 22.10. It says, what? Do not. Does it say do? It says do not seal the words of this prophecy, of this book, for the time is at hand. What time is at hand, brothers and sisters? The time for Jesus to come. And Jesus is coming very far off? No, no, my friends, he is coming very, very soon. And we are going to look at how soon his coming is. Revelation 22, 7, behold, I what? I come quickly. Read it with me. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. How quickly is Jesus coming? He himself says he is coming very quickly. Brothers and sisters, in the book of Revelation, the book that some speculate that cannot be understood, the book that some speculate is a closed book, we are told that two-thirds of the verses are found in the book of Revelation are found elsewhere in the Old Testament. So if two-thirds of the verses in the book of Revelation are found in the Old Testament, does that mean that we should ignore the rest of the Bible because the same passages are found elsewhere? No, absolutely not. We are to hear, understand, and follow. Hear, read, and keep. Just as we read in verse 17. What other book does Jesus refer to as an end-time prophetic book that we should study? Now, is the book of Revelation the only book we should study for end-time prophecies? No, absolutely not. There is another book, but we don't have to speculate with this either because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, therefore, read it with me everybody, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him. Daniel was a prophet that talked about the end of time. And brothers and sisters, Daniel is a book that has a twin. And what is the twin? 
revelation. Daniel has the key to unlock revelation. So I want to invite you to come with me to the book of Daniel. I want to invite you on a journey tonight that will help us unveil prophecy, help us understand prophecy, and help us understand where we are today. Now Daniel, who was Daniel? Daniel was a man, a young man, who was royalty. He was from the, the royal line of David. He was of the tribe of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar came and captured Judah and, and, and destroyed Judah, and he took captives. So here's this man that is taken from his home as a captive, as a slave, and what happens? They march him hundreds of miles through the hot, sandy desert. He is cast, he is made a eunuch. Everything that defines him, his nation, his blood, his manhood is stripped away from him. And he is placed in a foreign country, he is placed in a foreign atmosphere, but yet what does Daniel do? He purposes in his heart that he will what? He will stay true, that he will follow God. Now Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar saw promise in him. He sends Daniel to the, to the University of Babylon, if you will. Now follow me to the University of Babylon. Here was the elite of the elite, the world's masters at the science, astronomy, and philosophy. And here's Daniel placed in their presence. And as he graduates three years later, a statement is made, a very profound statement. Any of you remember what that statement is? Nebuchadnezzar says, this man, Daniel, and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those are their Hebrew names, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the king makes a statement and he says, men are what? Ten times wiser. Now, of their own might, of their own wisdom, of their own brain power, are they ten times wiser? No. What makes them ten times wiser? The Word of God. God living in them. Them purposing in their hearts to follow God. That, my brothers and sisters, is what makes them ten times wiser. They graduate, and the king adds them to his team of the elite his team of wise men and counselors. Everything seems to be going fine until one night an event happens that shakes the world. Not only did it shake Nebuchadnezzar's night and the few days that followed, but it comes down to our, our time today. And it reveals to us something that we're going to talk about tonight. It reveals to us the time of the future, the, the time of the end, Jesus' second coming. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. We are going to look at that climactic event and we are going to see what happens. Follow with me in your Bibles or with me on the screen. If you're there in your Bible, say amen. We are going to stay here in the book of, Revela uh, the book of Daniel chapter 2 for quite some time. So keep your finger there. We may be switching back and forth, but I want to encourage you to stay in Daniel chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles, read it with me on the screen. Opening into Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. In the, second key, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled. His sleep broke from him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. Moving on. The king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream, or troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to him in Aramaic and said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dreams. Well, what? Get the interpretation. We will reveal the interpretation. So here he has this very disturbing dream. And he says, wise men, if you are so wise, if you are connected to divinity, you claim to be a descendants of the gods, I want to know what I dreamed. Question. Can you tell me what I dreamed tell you what you dreamed last night. But guess who can? God can. Who can? God can. Now, the King Nebuchadnezzar is challenging the Chaldeans to tell him not just what his dream means, but to tell him the dream. They said they couldn't, and the king responds with what? My decision is firm. 
if you do not make known the dream to me and what? Its interpretation, you shall be what? Cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. He was going to not only destroy them, but he was going to erase their lineage. He was going to destroy their houses and their hands and their families. Other versions say he would make their houses a dunghill or an outhouse, a place where people use the bathroom. This was the anger the king had. But not for long. Why? And, and we'll get to that. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. But what happens? The Chaldeans answer the king and say, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's, mass, king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. They are telling the king, you are an unfair king. You are a not righteous king. You are asking something that has never ever been before been asked. Why are you putting us to the test like this? You know we cannot do this. Is it a difficult thing that the king requests? It is a difficult thing the king requests. There is none other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is what? Not with man. Now right here, the wise men for the first time in their lives a statement that is actually true. They say that what? The only one who can answer the question that you have asked is who? The gods. Now, they go on to say their dwelling is not with flesh. We don't have that connection with the gods that we claimed to have. They were honest. They, for the first time in their career, they said, okay, we are a fraud. We have claimed to be something that we are not. Think the king was happy? No, read the rest of the verse with me. It says, for this reason the king was what? Angry and very furious and he gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He said, kill them all. I'm done with them. I don't need them anymore. So they go and they come to Daniel. The decree goes out and they begin killing the wise men and they seek Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now I think it's very interesting. Was Daniel at the primary No. But yet King Nebuchadnezzar said that he was ten times wiser. What I think is going on here, and it's again speculation, and I want to be upfront with you on that. Daniel was the new kid on the block. And the wise men were like, we can handle this, this is a matter. Here's this foreigner, here's this slave that the king rose to a powerful position and claimed to be ten times wiser. Why does this guy need to have this high and mighty privilege? Don't tell Daniel, we can handle this on ourselves. We're going to prove to the king that we can excel, that we can also be great. And what happened? They failed. So they go and they say, oh, don't forget about Daniel over here. He's also one of us. Moving forward, they go to capture Daniel. The captain, Ariok, he comes to Daniel and he says, Daniel, I'm here to kill you. And Daniel says, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king, give him what? Time that he may tell the king the interpretation. Why? Because Daniel was in connection with the one that was enthroned. Not Nebuchadnezzar, but who? The God of heaven. And friends, I don't want you to miss this point. Daniel was in connection with who? With God. God is the only one when we are connected to him that gives us the power. So Daniel goes in before the king. He asks the king for time. He comes back to his house. He makes the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they may seek the mercies of God, which what? They, they may seek the mercies of God. What is that? Prayer. They're going to have a prayer meeting. We're going to seek the mercies of God concerning this secret. So Daniel and his companions may not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. When Daniel was at a crisis in his life, what did he do? Did he turn like Nebuchadnezzar to man? To man's wisdom? To man's philosophy? 
To who? To God, the God of heaven. Daniel turned to the God of heaven and he said, God, help me. I am in a crisis. I need you. My dependence is in you. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel. How? Read it with me, everybody. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel did what? He blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the, the God, the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Friends, let's, let, let's not miss this point. Daniel goes to the king. He says, Give me time. He comes back. And what does he do? He places his confidence in God. He prays. Him and his three friends, they pray. They place their faith in God. And then what happens? I don't want you to miss this. How was the secret revealed to Daniel? In a night vision. What do we call that, friends? A dream. In order to have a dream, we speculate Daniel must have had to be sleeping. But yet Daniel was getting ready to be slain the next day. Daniel was, his life was on the line. He was about to be excommunicated, to be, to be killed. But what happens? He places his faith in God. He prays, and then he goes to sleep. How many of you tonight, if you knew that tomorrow you did not tell me what you dreamed, and I was going to kill you, how many of you tonight would be sleeping? My hand does not even go up. But yet Daniel had such a peace, such a, such a confidence in God that he did what? He went to sleep and the dream was revealed to him through what? Through a dream. He knew that with the shadow of a doubt that God was going to what? He was going to reveal the dream. God was going to use him in a way he had never used him before. And he knew that because he had what? He had faith. Faith is what? Relationship. Faith is relationship. Faith is relationship. We're going to see what that dream is. As he had a dream, it is revealed to him. We are going to see this image, which you saw a replica outside. We have it on the banner, so we're going to keep referencing this banner as we go through each stage of this dream. But before we go there, I want to bring some very important points out. Dan God says to us, just as Daniel found his confidence in God, God says to us, ask and it will, what? Be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, what? Receives. And he who seeks, finds. And he who knocks, it will be opened unto him. God is telling us, if you place your faith in me, I will what? I will answer. I will answer. Going on here, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to him that asks? There is a whole sermon just in that Bible verse. We're not going to go there tonight, but I'm going to leave you with this thought. If we as parents, I am not a parent yet, but if as parents, we desire, we long to give good gifts to our children, how much more God desires to give us gifts. When we what? When we pray. When we ask. Later on, at the end of his life, Daniel finds himself in the lion's den. And where did he turn to? He turned to God. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost that come to God through him, since he always lives intercession for us. God is here saying, I live now, I rose from the grave, I live now, and my goal, my dream, my desire is to, to answer your request, to save you, and to make intercession for you. When we pray, we pray to God in Jesus' name is the only way our prayers can be answered. Moving on. So what happens? Daniel wakes up, he goes to the king, and he says, 
the king Nebuchadnezzar answers him, Are you able to make this thing known to me that I have seen and the interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and he said, What? Say it with me. The secret that the king has demanded, the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Now Daniel was considered what? A wise man. So Daniel is here saying, as a wise man, I am coming to you and I am saying the secret that you have asked, what you have asked us to do, we cannot answer. We cannot fulfill. But what happens? As we go on, he does what? But there is what? There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be what? Say with me. In the latter days, your dream and the visions, upon, uh, the visions of your head upon your bed are these. And we go now into the dream. But I don't want to miss this point. Think about Nebuchadnezzar. He has had this dream. He has asked the wise men to answer. They cannot answer. He gives Daniel an extra day. He gives him grace. Daniel comes before him and he says, after he asks him, can you reveal this dream? And Daniel says, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers, we can't reveal this dream. And I could just see Daniel's, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's countenance fall. As he, re as he almost realizes that this guy was just stolen for time. This guy is a fake just like... But then, as, Dan as the words come out of Daniel's mouth, what... There is a God in heaven who reveals what? Secrets. And makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall pass. I can just see Nebuchadnezzar inching to the edge of his throne and with excitement and anticipation to remember what the dream was, he asks, what is it? What is it? And Daniel comes out and he says, as for you, O king, the thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed about what should come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what shall be in the latter days. But as for who? As for me, again, Daniel says, it is not because of my power, but because I have, or because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. He says... It is not for any purpose now, but it is so that you can know the interpretation of your heart and those that are going to come after you. It is not any power. Again, Daniel says, it is not because of my power. Brothers and sisters, I have a question for you tonight. We all have these four questions that we ask in our lives. Read it with me. Question number one, how did I get here? How did, who am I? How did I get here in this world with all this sin and suffering? What is my purpose while I am here? What has God called me to do? What does my life hold? Number three, read it with me. How should I live my life while I am here? These are questions that cross each of our minds. Question number four, where am I going when I die? Are these all questions that we have asked? Friends, the Bible has the answer. And tonight, we are going to look at, excuse me, at some of those answers. And in the future nights coming, we're going to answer each of these questions. Daniel chapter 2. We look at this dream. You, O king, were watching. And behold, what? A great image. This image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of what? Read it with me. This image's head was of? Fine gold. Its chest and arms of? Silver. Its belly and thighs of? Bronze, its legs of what? Iron, its feet, partly of what? Iron and clay. And then what? You watched until what happened? A stone that was cut out without human hands struck the image in its feet of iron and clay and broke it into pieces. And what happened? The iron, the clay, the bronze, the stone crushed together and became the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind kept them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the earth became a great mountain and filled the whole Brothers and sisters, tonight we're going to see what that interpretation is. This is the beauty of God. Daniel does not hesitate. He does not say, you know, I've told you what you dreamed. Now, I think I can give an explanation of an interpretation. 
No. Friends, what does Daniel do? He goes right into it and he says, and my screen just blacked out. Daniel 2.36. Read it with me. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 36. I'm going to set this down. I'm going to join you guys down here. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 36. What does he say? He says, hold on, let me get there. I'm here now. Daniel 2 and verse 30 says, he said, This dream, this is the dream, and now we will tell the interpretation before the king. Daniel does not hesitate. Daniel does not wait. Daniel does not dilly-dally. He jumps right into it. He says, this, my friends, is what? This is the dream, and now I'm going to tell you the interpretation. And he jumps right into it. Brothers and sisters, read with me. Verse 37, he says, Thou, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. He does not hesitate. He says, The God of heaven has placed you in this role because he has a purpose for your life. Brothers and sisters, he goes on in verse 38 and he says, Wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, he has given them into your hand, he has made you a ruler over them. Art this head of gold. Read it with me again in verse 38. The last phrase he says, Daniel says, What? Thou art this head of gold. You are this head of gold. He doesn't dilly dally. God answers him the question and he says, You, O Nebuchadnezzar, are what? You are this head of gold. Now, on the, on the screen, we don't have it. I'm going to describe it for you. So, picture with me in your minds Babylon. Babylon was a, a, a golden city. Everything there was about Babylon was gold. There were 18 tons of gold found in the, in the idol, in the altar, and in the temple of Marduk. 18 tons of gold. How many pounds is that? 36,000 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold. Babylon was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. People traveled from everywhere to come see this beautiful and powerful and majestic city. There were gardens, hanging gardens, that were draped from the ceiling. Plants and flowers from, from everywhere you could imagine were here in these hanging gardens. Babylon was significant for gold. It represented, literally represented, gold. Now, brothers and sisters, does Daniel stop there? No, he does not. Daniel goes on and read with me. Brothers and sisters, go to verse 39. He says, after thee shall arise what? Another kingdom inferior to thee. There's going to come another kingdom that is not as prosperous as gold, that is not as expensive or as precious as gold, but is it is symbolic of what? Silver. There's going to come another kingdom that is going to be more powerful, but yet in its power, it will never reach the grandeur and, the, and the, the wealth that Babylon reached. Brothers and sisters, just as silver is inferior to gold, the kingdom that would come after... No worries. Thank you. The kingdom that would come after was what? It was not as pure, it was not as wealthy, but the kingdom that would come after was more powerful. We are not left to speculation. The Bible answers the question and it says, turn with me to Daniel chapter 5. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 25. Here we have King Belshazzar, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He is having this feast and he is blaspheming God and he is challenging God. He's like, who is the God that can... That can that, that can be more powerful than me. We serve the gods of wood and the gods of stone. Yet, as he's there in his revelry and as he is drinking and partying, a bloodless hand writes on the wall. Many of you will remember the story. And the writing on the wall, it says, verse 25, go with me there, brothers and sisters, it says, Mini, Mini, Tikal, you farsin. The handwriting on the wall by the bloodless hand, Mini, Tikal, you farsin. Again, we do not have to speculate again. We don't have to wonder what this means. But get God gives us the answer. Again, Daniel comes and he says again, not because of who I am, but it's because of who God is in me. That is how I can give you the answer to this dream, to this, this handwriting. Verse 26, read it with me. 
This is the interpretation of the thing, meaning God has numbered thy kingdom and has finished it. Tekel thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to who? The Medes and Persians again God outlines. I don't have to speculate. The Bible tells me the kingdom that was going to come right after. The kingdom of Babylon is the kingdom of what? The kingdom of Medo-Persia. And in verse 31, we are told, or verse 30, that night King Belshazzar was slain and Darius the Mede with the kingdom being threescore and two years. Now, brothers and sisters, are we back on? Phil, okay. I'm going to switch back to here. I love preaching from my Bible, by the way. Um, technology is good. But I love preaching from my Bible. Uh, let me find out where I'm at. Give me one second. Um, we've touched on the chest and arms of silver. Um, okay, here's where we are. Isaiah 45, 1. Now, this is what is so beautiful about God. And I'm sorry for for the inner transition in technology. Technology is good most of the time. Isaiah chapter 45, 1. God uses prophecy to answer prophecy. Let us go to a prophecy found in the book of Isaiah about 160 years before Babylon was taken. How long? Approximately about 160 years before Babylon was taken. Isaiah is given a message. He says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, who? To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations by and to loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors or the levied gates depending on what version you're using so that the gates will not be shut and the rest of the uh, talks about uh, some more of the finds a little bit more of what happened now question what happened when Babylon was captured the Median and Persian armies, they diverted the river Euphrates, they marched under the city walls, through the levied gates, the water gates, through the levied gates, which were not just like the Bible said. I'm having trouble here, so I'm turning it off. Okay, so he walked through the levied gates, just as the Bible had said. They, divert, they walked under the walls, and what happened? They marched in and they overtook Babylon. Now, 160 years before, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Isaiah, had a prophecy that Cyrus, by name, would capture Babylon. Babylon was impregnable. The walls were so thick that you could race two chariots side by side on the top of the walls. That's something better than approximately 30 feet, if you will, give or take. That means at the base, it was estimated to be anywhere from 100 to 160 feet wide. There was no way getting into that, but God said what? He said, I will what? Let Babylon fall, Babylon what? Babylon fell. The next kingdom to come was Medo-Persia. We have the Cyrus Cylinder. I don't have my notes. The Cyrus Cylinder. I can make it there. So the Cyrus Cylinder describes the battle. It describes what happened. It was a piece of archaeology located by the British Museum located in the British Museum in London that tells about the fall of Babylon. Where it described how Cyrus took Babylon. Okay. I'm just going to turn this off. I'm going to go off my head. I don't have my notes. Okay. Thank you. So the Cyrus Cylinder describes what happened and how Babylon was taken. You can move on. Let us go back to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 39. After you will arise what? Another kingdom inferior to yours, another third kingdom of bronze shall bear rule over all the earth. We know that this kingdom is represented by Greece. Greece ruled from about 331 BC to 168 BC. Moving on. Alexander the Great. Many of you here have heard this name, Alexander the Great. You know him as the tactic general at 30 years of age, just a little older than I am, he conquered the world in seven years. He was named the swift general because he flew so quickly and conquered so many nations so swiftly. Moving on. 
Let's read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. The fourth king is strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, like iron that crushes. The kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Now, we have here the kingdom of gold. We talked about the significance of gold in Babylon. We have here the kingdom of Medo-Persia, the significance of the silver in Medo-Persia, I forgot to mention. Silver was what Media and Persia charged taxes to their nations, to their subjects. When they conquered a nation, they would charge their subjects with silver. They would have to pay silver in taxes. The silverware that we eat with today originated from Persia during this time, time frame. Then we have brass. Cyrus the, um, not Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, the general who became king of Greece, he was the first one to use the technology to smelt bronze, to smelt two metals together. And if you had a bronze sword, you could practically cut a copper sword in two. That is one of the reasons, because of the technology that he had, that he would conquer so great. The next one we have here, Rome, the legs of iron, representing Rome, from 168 BC to 487, uh, 476 AD. Now, Rome was rightly described as a nation that conquered, that crushed. Now, why do you say the Roman army had a technology where they would max their shields together and they would run towards their enemies, knocking them down, trampling upon them, crushing them underfoot, and then whatever was left, they would have others come behind them and kill them. And that was one of the ways that they would literally crush their, 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 uh, their foes. They would come through and, and just utterly smash them and destroy them. But brothers and sisters, just after each of these kingdoms, what was the last kingdom? It was the, after Rome, it was the feet of iron. Did another kingdom come? No, another kingdom would not come. Whereas thou saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom will be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed in potter's clay or ceramic clay. Moving on. Here we have the division of the European kingdom. After Rome, Rome was never conquered. Jesus said Rome would not be conquered. Rome was never conquered. We have here the divisions of the European nations, the Anglo-Saxons, the an ancient Anglo-Saxons, became the English, the Lombards, the Spanish, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Visigoths, the Spanish, the Franks, the French, the Suve, the Portuguese, the Alamanni, the Germans, the Ariali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths are, have become extinct. They are no longer uh, current. So you have the divided European kingdom, the feet of iron and clay, representing the modern European nations. Now, something significant about that, you can move on to the next slide. What attempts have been made to unify Europe? The Bible mentions that the European nations would never unify and never come together. In here we have what? As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another. Just as iron does not mix with clay, they shall not cleave one to another. Through battle, we have here Napoleon. Napoleon defied God and he says, I will unite Europe one mighty nation. Here we have Napoleon's tomb, a testament to all time that he fought in uniting Europe. Why? Because God said they would never be united just as the feet of iron and clay do not mix. God said they would never be reunited and today the kingdom shall be divided and it has remained divided. Here are some others. We have Charlemagne. He was defeated. Charles V, he was defeated. King Louis XIV, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Adolf Hitler, they all defied God and they all said, we will make one nation out of Europe. And what happened? They were not able to succeed. Just last year we had what? The Brexit. What was the Brexit? The Brexit was a direct fulfillment, I believe, of Bible prophecy. Just as God said the, they would not mix, Britain left the Union a direct fulfillment of Bible prophecy. When God says something will come to pass, it will come to pass. Moving on. Just as we see each of these metals, we have the gold, we have the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the iron and clay, the divided kingdoms and the divided nations. Each of those have what? They have passed. But brothers and sisters, what is the last of that is yet to come? We have that stone. 
That stone, brothers and sisters, is coming. And what does that stone represent? Next slide. God alone knows the future. That is the testimony that we have through each of these prophecies. Next slide. If Jesus con controls the rise and fall of world empires, can you trust him to guide and to direct your life? Answer is a resounding yes. Say that with me again. There was not the confidence. I didn't hear the confidence. If God can fulfill future, does he control my life and your life? Yes, absolutely. Moving on. What next what would happen to these kings, as the Bible says? What time period is in this earth's timeline? What is the next event? In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be left to another. It shall not be left to another. It shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever and ever. Moving on. Just as each of these kingdoms passed into history, we too can look forward to the kingdom that God will create. Next, next slide. Revelation 17, 12, and 13, read it with me. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Those are of one mind. Now, coming very, very soon, we will have a beast power where these nations will again attempt to unite, and we're going to be talking about that in a later night. So I'm not going to get ahead of myself. But right now, there claims to be many voices, but one people. This is the flag of the European Union, where they say, and they defy God when he says they will mix, and God says they will not. They claim that they cannot, that they can become yet another kingdom. Revelation 17, 4, 14. This, this power that is going to come in the last day, they will make war with the Lamb and will overcome them. The, um, sorry, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is what? Is the Lamb? Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. God is challenging us tonight, brothers and sisters, that we are called. He has told us that we are called, and he is challenging us to be faithful. How will God set up his kingdom that will cause earthly kingdoms to crumble? Daniel 2.34, you watched while a stone was cut out without human hands that struck the image in its feet that were of iron and of clay, and he broke them in pieces. And as in the days of these kings, the God will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand, how long? Forever. And as we come to a close, the stone that will set up God's eternal kingdom. Who is that stone? Again, we can turn to the Bible, not to speculation. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, we are told the rock, the spiritual rock is who? It is Christ, brothers and sisters. We don't have to speculate. God answers our questions. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. He is that stone. Just as each of the other kingdoms have come and passed over the last 2,500 years of Earth's history, the last event yet to come is that stone. And that stone is who? Is Jesus. As I come to a close tonight, I want you guys to think. Where... Do I fall in this world's history? And what am I going to do? What is the decision that I'm going to make? I'm going to share a quick story. Mrs. Mills plays the piano. And I want you guys to think in your minds, as I, ask the, as I tell this story, where are you and where are you headed? There was a farmer who lived in Long Island, New York. He was attempting to hire some hirelings, some servants, to work on his farm. Now, as he was going through, he was looking at the resumes, and there were many qualified people. But there was one resume that stood out in particular. On the bottom of the resume, I sleep on windy nights. I sleep on windy nights. And the farmer was wondering, what in the world does this mean? So he called the young man in, and as the young man came, and he said, I sleep on windy nights. He asked him what it meant. He said, I sleep on windy nights. That was the only response he had. He's like, well, you're qualified, you're hired. So he takes him to his farm. 
begins to work and he begins to take care of the farm. But one day, as they were sleeping, darkness came and a storm came, a tornado came and, and, and started to tear up through the valley, through, through the island. And brothers and sisters, the farmer gets up and he goes to waken the boy and he goes to say, come, we have to tie down the haste. We have to turn in the, the sheep and the pigs into the, into the barn and gather the chickens. We have to get everybody in. We have to tie everything down. And the boy could not be woken up. The farmer in his anger and rage, he said, that's it. I am firing this young man tomorrow. Why? Came the words to his mind, I sleep on windy nights. I cannot be woken up on windy nights. And the farmer began to be discouraged. And he with his lantern into his farm and guess what he sees the haystack is tied down the animals are in the barn everything is secured every eye is bowed every head is closed every eye, every head is bowed every eye is closed tonight as came to that young man that that farmer the young man was able to sleep on windy nights why he was able to sleep because he was prepared. Brothers and sisters, there is a storm coming, a very great and powerful storm, a storm that will destroy this earth, a storm that will eradicate sin and suffering, and I want to be ready when that storm hits. How about you? If this is your desire to be ready when that storm hits, I invite you to raise your hands tonight. If tonight God is coming upon your hearts, that as you in the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron and the feet of iron and clay all pass into history. And as we see tonight, that stone that is coming we know represents Jesus. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. If that is your desire and you say with, your all, with all of your heart, I want to be ready when Jesus comes, I invite you to raise your hand. So my brother comes up and he sings a chorus to a song. Just the chorus. I want you to think about yourself. Are we ready? Why? Because the Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart what is your answer to him friends what is your answer to jesus today as he is calling upon your heart as he is waiting for you to answer what is going to be your answer today are you going to be ready if it is your desire i invite you to raise your hand as we close with a word of prayer Father in heaven, Lord, you see the hands tonight. Lord, you see and you hear the hearts that are opening to you as you have claimed, as you have promised that you are waiting to take us in your hands. Lord, I want to thank you so much for your loving kindness and for hearing our prayers tonight. Lord, we do not want to keep you waiting. Tonight, as we see each of the kingdoms have passed into history, the next event is your coming. We want to thank you Lord, tonight, for reaching your hand and saving a sinner like me. Thank you tonight, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is coming soon. It's not by accident that God brought you here tonight. You are here because you need to hear, because we need to know where we are in history. You may be wondering what happened with the slides. It is fixed. Windows decided to update in the middle of your presentation. 
Satan didn't want you to hear this message. Are you with me? Satan didn't want you to hear this message, but praise God, Pastor Jericho, you had the Bible and you just carried right on. Tomorrow night, we're going to be diving into one of the most, to me, moving topics that we'll be studying, the origin of evil. You don't want to miss it. It lays the foundation of where sin came from, why we are where we are now. We will be going to before creation and what the Bible and prophecy reveals about that. I want to encourage you to invite your friends. Make sure that tomorrow night you're here because I know, just like tonight, God has a special blessing for us as we move into our topic tomorrow evening, the origin of sin and what Jesus has to say about it. God bless you. Good night. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening.